Hello, and welcome to this webinar uh, on China's education system, how it is organized and operates, and how reforms, both past and current, have reshaped education in China over time. Andreas Fleischer, director of the OECD Directorate for Education and Skills, will present our special guest, Yuan Yuan Pan, a graduate student at the University of Chicago and author of the report, Education in China, a Snapshot. Both of them will be available later to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to send your questions to Eric Magnuson using the chat function at any time during the presentation. Andreas? Thanks so much and welcome to the webinar. Uh, the PISA results have raised enormous interest in education in China. In 2012, they showed that the 10% most disadvantaged students in the province of Shanghai in China who were assessed by PISA did better than, for example, the 10% wealthiest students in the United States and some other, some European countries. So there's been enormous interest in education in China and we were very, very fortunate to have during those years Yuan Yan Pan with us at the OECD, who actually then wrote a very interesting report that actually described the education system in China, and in particular in the four provinces for which the latest PISA round does provide comparative data. So I'm really delighted to introduce Yuan Yan. She's been an amazing contributor to the PISA process at the OECD, but in particular contributed the background report that she's going to present right now. Well, thank you, Mr. Andreas. Thank you so much for your inviting. And shall I share my video? So I feel very happy to see everybody again. And thank you so much for Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So this is morning in the U.S. <laughs> and I feel very greatly honored to get this chance to introduce this book for you. And I thank you so much for your interest in the education in China. As the time is limited today, so I would like to show my thanks to everybody together who has helped with this book and also helped with this webinar. And as the book has, oh, let me share my screen first, okay. Okay, yes, so as a book has a lot of content, which we, we cannot cover in a short time, so I choose some of them, which I guess could be important to understand the education in China and also maybe interesting for you. So today we're going to go through the following topics. Firstly, there will be some background information, and then we're going to talk about how the management uh, department in China works. And next, we're going to talk about the current educational reforms and some current issues. And in the end, I will talk some brief introduction about all the participant regions in PISA 2015. <laughs> so uh, let's begin with some background information on China's administrative system, um, which I guess could be important for your understanding of the education. So according to the constitution, there are three levels of government under the central government. There are province level, county level, and township level. For the province level, there are four different kinds of them. For municipalities, there will be only four municipalities in the whole China. In Beijing and Shanghai, there are two of them. And, <clears throat> and for provinces and autonomous regions, these two are quite similar. Uh, but as the name referred, that autonomous regions will have more power to decide these things by themselves because they have higher population of ethnic minorities. But province and autonomous regions, they too are very similar in size and they are much larger than the municipalities. So for the convenience of management, there will be prefectures between province level and county level, and these are very, uh, have a same, similar size as the municipalities. And when we refer to some cities in China, we are also mean the municipalities or the prefectures or counties. And the other two special administrative regions, Hong Kong and Macau, they will be very different from the mainland China. So we're not going to talk about, we're not going to talk about it today. 
that what, what was mentioned is the province level divisions are very important for the understanding of education in China because within the same province level divisions, the education could be very similar while within different, among different divisions, education could be different. Mm, and next, I would, I would like to mention we have a hookah system before I start the introduction, introduction of education. For the hookah system, it's a domicile system as the, and everybody will have a kind of passport like things, like the pictures on the bottom, bottom right. And it is mainly issued by families with your living information on it. And there's two important type of features for this hookah. Firstly, it's the type. And it have two types, agriculture or non-agriculture. Worth mentioning is this type is not strictly related to what your occupation is. It, it actually like comes from the plant economy era and heritage from parents. But these two different types will relate to different kinds of social welfare. Another important feature for the hukou is the location information, especially whether, whether you are local hukou or not. And there may be a reform for hukou coming soon, but I'm not sure yet. And what's mentioned is the location information will be very important for your education, especially compulsory education. And with this background information, let's start to talk about the management system in China. And we will go through these topics one by one. And let's start with the schooling development. So generally for a Chinese kid, we will start to go to preschool from two to three years old. And we will stay there until we get about six or seven years old, and we will start our compulsory education. There's nine-year compulsory education, and first six-year primary school, and then three years of junior secondary school. They are normally take in separate schools, but there will also be some schools who provide the nine-year education together. And the compulsory education is free for all citizens, and it's also required for the students who are about this, about this age. And, and each student is supposed to take attend the school within the area that their hukou system that a hukou location belongs to. That means they're supposed to attend the school who, which is nearest to them, not any school they want. And after that, there will be a high school entrance exam for them to decide which kind of high school they're going to attend. And some of them will choose to attend vocational education after that, but most of them will still attend general high schools. And three years later, there will be a college entrance exam, which we call it Gaokao. It is an important exam for almost all the Chinese students, and it will decide what kind of what kind of university you can attend. And after that, we will go to higher education, and we will spend four years to get a bachelor degree. And after that, if you want to go further study, you need to attend the graduate program entrance exam. And then, <coughs> sorry, and then we will spend about three years to get a master's degree. And after that, if you want to go to a PhD program, you may take the graduate program entrance exam again, or maybe you're not, and you spend another three years to get a PhD. And or you may directly get a PhD degree after bachelor program, which will only take so five years. And after this, you may wonder where is the participant for the PISA test that is 15 years old. And they are either the last year of the compulsory education or the first year of high school. And then we start to have a look at the management department of China. Um, Ministry of Education is an important department in the State Council, and it has 27 departments, which covered nearly all aspects of education in China, and there will also be 32 affiliated, affiliated organizations. They will be more specialized, like uh, research institutions, so the NEA, who are cooperate with PISA test um, in China, and they are the, one of the organizations and majored in education evaluation. And they were also managing some universities directly. So for the local government, there will also be Bureau of Education with the similar structures. And the policies related to education will go from the higher level government to the lower level ones. And what's mentioned is there will uh, like each public school will belong to one level of the Bureau of Education or Ministry of Education. 
And after this, and after this, we'll start to talk about the how the government is managing the development of education. The we are many through the five year guideline of education, which the basic goal is taken by the national wide five nine five year guideline, and then the Ministry of Education will develop the detailed five year guideline for especially for education, and then we will summarize the last five years before we start the next five years. And this development plan will cover the educational development goal and basic ideas, and set clear the quantitative growth as well as the qualitative improvement in the special areas. And there will also be some special development plan according to the need of current situation. And then let's have a look at the policy and reforms. And policies and reforms are mostly comes together, but they are not like made decision by the department in charge directly. They actually comes out from some research and proposals and draft the policies by the Ministry of Education. And some of them may go to their website for public comments. And after that, they will be published uh, they will be issued and published on the website. And then they will be, at the same time, they will be sent to the lower level government. When the lower level government gets the policy from the Ministry of Education, and uh, Ministry of Education, and they will draft their own policies for their own district, and then go through the cycle until the policies go to each school. And for the reforms, it is not carried out all of a sudden. Um, the national, it is normally comes from the national policies and the, some of the areas will be chosen to do the pilot experiment. And after that, there will be analysis and summaries for the pilot experiments and the experience will be shared to all rest of the areas and then the reforms will be carried out national wide. And there is two, there's one important reforms now going on in China that is covered in the document National Media and Long Term Education Reform Development Program. Um, it covers all the reforms we're going to do from 2010 and 2020. And there will be a special department established in the Ministry of Education to meet these reforms. So that is to say, within these years, the education in China could change a lot. And let's have a just let's have a glance at the educational finance. And as we expected, the main resource will be the government appropriation for education. But when the government made the decisions, they have four priorities. That is to set priorities for rural, remote, poor, and minority areas. Priority for vocational education and preschool education. Priority for the subsidization for school for students from poor families, and also priorities for expense on building high quality teaching teams. So that is what the government emphasized most now. And we'll start to talk about teachers in a little bit more details. So as in many like other areas, um, the teachers, if you want to be a teacher in China, you need to pass the qualification exam. So there will be four kinds of different ex examinations for different levels of education, uh, educations, but they will be similar in structure so that they will have to pass the written exam in the beginning and then get to the interview where they need to show some sample lectures and they need to pass both of them to get a certificate. And you get a certificate of teaching certificate, that doesn't mean you can be a teacher. After that is just you can you can be qualified as a candidate. And after that, the teachers need to pass a lot more exams for from the local government or from the schools to get the teaching post. And that also doesn't mean that you can be a teacher forever. You need to reject regularly every five years in the local government to keep your position, to keep your certificate valid. And this is implemented in 2013. And to pass the regular register, you need to you need to meet the following requirements, that you need to pass the ethic evaluation and annual assessment, and need to finish uh, the required training hours or get equivalent amount of credit. 
and you need to be psychological and physical health to qualify it. And there will maybe some other requirements by the local government. It sounds a little bit crucial, but actually I, I want to mention that the, the it doesn't mean that if the teacher is ill or is some kind of disabled, they will lose their job. So th this is just to keep the teacher to be like be, like keep in the best state to be the teacher. If they get ill, they, they can retire earlier and with still with some of the salaries. But that, that doesn't mean that if they get ill, they were going to lose their job. And then we're going to talk a little bit detailed about the teacher's training. For the teacher, as I mentioned just now, for the regular register system, so each teacher is required to take some amount of lectures every five years, and there will be 120 class hours extra for the new teachers. And they have the similar requirements for the school principals. And besides this, there will also be special training programs for teachers and principals. For teachers, there's two current most popular training programs that they are trying to they are trying to um, train the exemplar teachers. That means the schools will send their best teachers to attend this program. It is normally held by the best teaching normal universities, and they will like give let the teachers know the most advanced teaching skills and know the new things. And the second project is the special project for the rural teachers. For, for teachers in rural areas, try to cultivate more teachers for the rural areas. And for the national, for the principals, they will also have training program, and also they can have they can take a half year sabbatical day every five years to learn some new ideas from abroad or from some more like better schools. And this is, and you may wonder that why the government want to train the outstanding teachers instead of the teacher who are not that good enough. And that because this is just part of the training. There's also another part of the training system which is carried out within each school. So I will go through this for example. So there will be a teaching and research school research school system in each school. For example, there will be a school with three grades and three classes. So there will be a leader in each classes which will like managing all the subjects. If they notice there is one subject which is leaving behind, that this leader may may like get some may want to push that teacher a little bit. And there will also be a leader for whole grade, which manage all the subjects as the leader in the class. And if they notice some subject is leaving behind, they may also push that subject a little bit. And for a whole grade math teacher, for example, there will also be a leader that they will try to share among the whole grade math teacher about the teaching steps, how they will maybe prepare for the lectures together, and they will share the problems they met. And this will be similar to like the whole schools, for example, the whole school's math teacher will be also be in a research group and they will share information more about like generally teaching skills or the whole the whole subject's development. And this will be the same for all other subjects. And there will also be a lecture auditing system that, for example, like each, each teacher within this school are required to attend like 20 or 10 of the lectures of their colleagues and they need to give feedback or their own summaries out of them. So in this way, they can learn from each other within the same school. And you may wonder that why the teachers want to help with each other, uh, because they are some kind of um, competitive there. And because, uh, and I would like to say maybe because the teachers have their titles, and if we want to, if they want to go to higher level titles like the senior level, they are required to prove that they have helped with other teachers' improvement. So, and this is the teachers' titles, and they they will start maybe from the first grade or the third grade, and they will go go to the upper step by step. 
and there will also be special grade teachers, which is the owner and also a grade. It's not a title, but it's a like a special prize. And for the teacher salaries, they have a reform in 2009, and there will be two parts: the basic part and the performance salaries. And worth mention is the teacher salary is guaranteed by the central government. It's written in the law that is have to be make sure it will be similar level as the government officials. And then let's talk a little bit about the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum now in China is a three level curriculum and the national level uh, will decide some general principles and some lecture hours with uh, each subject like they will require each school have to have um, have Chinese have Chinese course, have math course, etc. And for the prep, and then the national curriculum will pass to provinces, and provinces will decide more detailed plans, like what kind of subject we want in this in our province, and what kind of book we're going to use, and then pass to the school. The school itself could also decide some extra elective courses, and they will decide how they're going to arrange all the lectures and, and how they are going to make the schedules. And the current national-wide subjects for different grades, they cover, we will start the morality, Chinese, math, PE, art from the early primary grade. And after that, we will, we will start the English from primary school, the fourth grade. And then for the senior secondary education, we will encourage the individual development. So from the lower level education to the higher level education, um, I mean, for the higher education, the, the more um, schools are encouraged to do more diversified. And this is going to be the basic scenario for, for the national curriculum requirements. So, so for some provinces, this could be different. And then let's have a look at the education reforms and some current issues. And we're going to talk about these four topics. The first is the inspection system reform. Well, the inspection actually started a long time ago in China, but after the reform, this actually just start to be quite effective. That is, uh, the, the inspection system required each school to have an inspector and the inspector's information will be hung out on the school's gate, like this picture shows. And they, until now, this already has an over 99%, almost all the schools have their inspectors. And the inspectors, um, they are required to visit schools regularly and give feedback or report, and give feedback to schools and report to the management department, and then give time for the school to make changes, and they will revise again. And again, so and and the, actually, the inspectors are in a rotation role, so to avoid the to avoid something which is bad. And uh, they uh, the government is trying to build a specialized team that is not only know the teaching, but also some of them may be expert on the school management, so that so that this feedback could be very effective. The second uh, reforms, which is actually the government is very focused on in the last few years, let's try to minimize the rural and urban difference. To do that, they start a balanced development of compulsory education special program, and they major especially in two areas, uh, in two different points. That is the infrastructure. They have special programs to build the underdeveloped part to build more to build better infrastructures for them and another part an important part is to improve the teaching results for the underdeveloped part for the rural part so they will have two special programs for the teaching results for that part the first is the special teaching post plan for rural schools that teachers are required to spend three years in rural area and there their salaries are guaranteed by central government, and they can decide to be stay to stay or live after three years. And the other one is the free pre-service teacher teacher education program. That is to that is an education program in the top four normal teaching normal universities. And students who attend to this program, they will get the whole higher education free and also have some incomes while they study. 
and they are supposed to go back to their home province, and they are required to serve two years in the rural areas. And there will be a special inspection certificate to for the provinces or for the for the for each level of divisions that if they pass the inspection, they will get a certificate for balanced development. And uh, another thing they are trying to do is they try to make the migrant students to get access to education equally. As I mentioned before, students are supposed to attend schools close to their home co-location, while actually that, that's not where they live. Maybe some of them, they will go go follow their parents to some other province to because of the because of the job. So this, the, the government are trying to make sure all child can really get free compulsory education everywhere around the, world, around the whole country. And they're also trying to start to make, like each student can take the college entrance exam in their living, living province instead of their local province. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the curriculum reform, which has been carried out for years and is still during the process and changing step by step. All, all in all, we are trying to transform from the subjected centered curriculum to to teach the student to learn how to learn and for to a more balanced and integrated and elective curriculum. And we will emphasize more of the essential knowledge and skills for lifelong learning instead of just know a lot of things. And the focus more on problem solving. And the evaluation system for the current curriculum will, more, will focus more on improvement instead of just the special scores. And the last one has already been achieved that the, the, one, the government wants to involve the central government, also local authorities and the schools to develop a cur curriculum together instead of just decided by the central government. And last one, I would like to talk about the college en entrance exam reforms, which is actually going to be promoted nationwide this year. And in the old college entrance exam, we will have three plus three plus X mode. The three stand for Chinese, math, and English. And the X will stand for social science or science, deciding on your choice. And it is only taken once a year. And before, it is actually each province will be more independent. They will design the exam by themselves. But now they're trying to change to a three plus three mode that the teacher, uh, that students have their freedom to choose any three of the subjects they, they're, interested in to, they're interested in. To the candidate, and they will be more national wide instead of province deciding them themselves. And the English level English will be changed to an English level test instead of the same instead of the same as Chinese and math. And some of the subjects will be taken twice a year, especially the English level test. And the, this college entrance exam have already uh, started the pilot experiment from 2014. And ha Shanghai have uh, and Shanghai and Zhejiang are the two areas chosen to be to do the pilot experiment. And the, and this new reform actually shifted the the students to choose their interest to high school area, like because if they want to choose the chemistry, for example, chemistry in their college, they have to take the chemistry subject in the high school. So they shift to the, the shift to the emphasize to choose the subject um, to the high school area, to the high school time. And besides the college entrance exam, there will also be the spring dog call in Shanghai area and also they are trying to be more university specified exams that they will try to make the college entrance exam not not anymore just the exam once in a lifetime that will decide your whole life. And we will see what is the effect after the reform of this year. And in the following part, I'm going to talk about briefly about all the Chinese participants of PISA test 2015. And generally, we can see the four participants. They are located in the east area of China, which means they are kind of more developed compared to rest areas. And Beijing and Shanghai, as I mentioned just now, as I mentioned before, is the two municipalities. 
And we can see from the picture that these two are much smaller compared to Jiangsu and Guangdong, these two are policies. And also they are more developed compared to the rest of the China. And uh, actually because Guangdong is more populated, so they will the the average spent for the education per student um, is actually below the national average. And we will go through them one by one. For Beijing, Beijing is the capital city of China, and it actually has the higher education level. It's the most well-educated city within China. It has a it has the best higher education resource because it has a, very, a lot of good a lot of good universities, and it is very developed in science and technology research. The plan reforms in Beijing, they're trying to emphasize quality and e equality together. For a quality part, they are they're doing reforms to change the teacher's training system. Instead of to ask teachers to join the lectures, they actually put the put the training people to the schools and ask them to audit, audit, audit the teachers' lectures and give feedback and design special training program for the teachers and come back times later. And besides, they're going to introduce good resources through open branches of good, good high schools or good secondary schools because Beijing also have different district, district and the education resource is not average in different dis district. So for some underdeveloped dist district, they're going to invite good schools from the high end district, for example, to open branches to make the quality better. And for the, for the equality, because Beijing as the capital city have a lot of migrant children, so they want to make sure that each student can access to education equally. And they will also carry out uh, electronic enrollment system to make sure all the enrollment are public viewing and nobody can like for example I pay more money so I go to better school that is no longer available. And Shanghai, Shanghai is the largest city by population in China. It is the commercial and finance center. It has the highest GDP per capita. It is actually also the most international city due to some history reasons and also currently development. And Shanghai always act as a pioneer in every kind of reforms, especially education reforms. So they, so they actually, the education in Shanghai is kind of a little bit different compared to rest of areas. And let's look at Jiangsu. Jiangsu is a very wealth province in China. And it actually is the first province to who get the certificate of balanced development. That that means they for Jiangsu province, the rural and urban area, the difference could be the not that much different. And there will be some wealth gap between the poor north and wealth south within the province. And what what was mentioned is the Jiangsu province is the demonstration zone for province level for province preschool education reform. That means they are going to take the preschool education similar as a compulsory education. And last, not the least, Guangdong province. They have the highest total GDP because they are a heart of made in China. And they are also the most populated and have a lot of migrant laborers. And they, they have a high, highest urbanized rate in provinces because they are the heart of manufacturing. And uh, one extra thing they want to mention is they share the cantonese with Hong Kong and Macau, and they located nearby, like here. And, and Guangdong's current reform is they are trying to increase the education investment. As I mentioned just now, they are actually below the national average. And another thing worth mentioning is uh, they, they have a Shenzhen, Shenzhen special economy zone. So this city, Shenzhen, will, it's going to be a little bit different compared to other cities, no matter in economy, but also a little bit in uh, education. Like for example, like Hong Kong and Macau, they start to establish um, like some good universities in Hong Kong, they are starting to build extra campus in Shenzhen area. And in the end, I will really take more than expected time, but in the end, I would like to do a personal summary. And 
was mentioned is that uh, in independently among each province level divisions, the education could be different. But well, they are generally different, but they are also kind of similar as they are going through their their steps, you know, similar management steps, and they are trying to learn from each other. The secondly, uh, there could be a large regional difference from compared to the west and the east, and also especially the big cities and other areas. So I was growing up in a small cities, and later I go to, I went to Beijing, and I can I can feel that the what we got for compulsory education area, uh, what we got in compulsory education could be quite different. And another thing is, it's very important that China's education is always a reform. Like when I, when I finished my compulsory education, compulsory education began began to be totally free. And when I start to go to the graduate program, the graduate program start to charge. So I actually paid more than average. And uh, another thing I want to mention is there could be some cultural influence in China's education. So in China, people will think if you understand, if you are outstanding in education, that means you will have a brilliant future. And also we try to kind of emphasize if you are good at math, you're clever. If you are good at science, uh, you are clever. And social, social science are kind of taken lower than the STEM subjects, but this is kind of changing now, I, I feel like that. And this is what I want to talk about, kind of random. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. And if I explain something wrong or you want to know more, here is my contact information. You can write me an email, and I can try to answer as much as possible. And thank you. Let's get back to the host. Um, Yes, thank you very much, Yuan Wan. Um, in fact, we do have several questions that came in during your presentation. Um, where do I begin? Uh, one person asked, what kinds of things are inspected by the school inspectors? Are they inspecting the teachers, or the administration of the school, student welfare? Could you expand a little bit about that? Yes, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I think, I think what the it's a good question, and the, the areas mentioned is actually all covered in the inspection. They they will have they will have uh, like, for example, like if this school they are trying to teach extra extra like try to have extra curriculum and push the student to study more, and so the student will don't have time for themselves. Maybe the inspector will say that is not good. So this is about the management part. And also if the one, for example, one teacher is not that responsible, um, there will be many complaints about the teachers, the inspector can report that. So it covers actually many aspects. And uh, there will be a standard list for what kind of, like a checklist, what kind of things they need to report for the inspectors. I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Um, we have several more. Um, mm -hmm. for, for one thing, uh, how many hours uh, in general do students spend at school every day in China? Ah, that is a very good question. <laughs> well, uh, actually, um, it depends on which grade you are in. <laughs> so if, it, if you happen to be the senior year of high school and preparing for the college entrance exam, you may spend like from seven, a.m. and study to like pretty sure you have breaks and get get back home at about 10 p.m. So for the high school part, it's very intense and it varies in different cities. So and, and that is what I want to mention just now for the big city difference and small city difference. Like in the big cities, they would emphasize more like the whole education for the student because they have more more maybe more resources, but for the small cities who are underdeveloped, they don't have other chances, and they the only thing they can do is try to perform best in the college entrance exam. So they will have spent more hours in study in schools. So the worst case is you start study from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. <laughs> but it's it's just for the high school area. For the junior high school, it's not that. 
much. Yeah, this is Andreas, just to add to this. In fact, we asked the students in the PISA exam to say how, and these are 15 year olds, to tell us how many hours they were uh, studying at school and at home, and it comes close to 60 hours per week. That's the number that students themselves, 15 year olds, were reporting as work in school or work at home in the PISA test in the four provinces which we talked about. Um, another question, how can children who have been left behind, whose parents have migrated elsewhere for work, but the children themselves remain in their hometowns, how can they be better supported in their education? Um, well, uh, this, how, how to say, like, um, firstly, um, this happened mostly in the rural area. And in the rural areas, um, what ca what China is currently doing now is trying to combine the like the schools from different villages to make it into the town, so they can have better education resource instead of running out of teaching resource. So most of them are boarding schools. So no matter their parents are at home or not, they mostly choose to attend the boarding schools. And another thing is another part of them they, they they will still have their relations, like they have their grandparents to be with them. And I guess there is no super extra care for them. I I, I really don't know about that. But as long as they are not, uh, as long as they show some problems in their in the in the studies. As I mentioned, there will be a leader in each class. That person will be like care about all the people who has that be behind or all the students who show some problems. I hope you I hope you answer this question. Yes, thank you. We have a couple of questions about teachers in China. Um, I'll, I'll ask them all together. Um, I think you were saying in your, in your presentation that 70% of teacher salaries is guaranteed by the government. How the, the rest of the 30%, is that related to teachers' performance or what? And also, how is teacher performance evaluated? Um, are bad? Are there are there such things as bad teachers? And if they are, what happens to them? Do they get fired? Are they retrained? What what is the process? Yes, this is a very good question. Uh, well, I, I I mentioned it's like the average, uh, like the total salary will be guaranteed to make sure to be the similar level as the government officials. And the 70 per, actually most like all the salaries of the teachers are from the government because <laughs> if they are public school teachers and they the post is kind of fixed so they will not be that easy to be fired because they have their post in this school but the the entrance like you want to get this post is very difficult and for the performance salary part uh, it is like changing with like it's still changing recent years because my parents, both, both of my parents are teachers, so I got to know this. So uh, in the beginning, there's only one salary, and then they, they now they have two salaries, and the performance salaries are evaluated by school. So actually, the total school shares the total school or the total grades and shares the same evaluation salaries, which uh, may not have the which have, haven't been linked to each teacher's performance yet, but it's still better than before, like all the teachers from the same level of school, they will have the same salary. And I think they will keep changing to the, like linked to the personal level. And uh, the, the, the salary will also be linked to their titles, if they are first level teachers or they are senior teachers. And uh, did I miss something? A lot of question just now? Did I miss something? Uh, no, oh, I, I think you covered everything except except if, if a teacher is found wanting uh, and his or her uh, performance, what happens to them? Uh, that, that, that is, um, if they cannot pass the regular register, their teaching qualification will be invalid, so they will lose the job. But if not because of that, uh, they will 
just be pushed by other teachers like the class managers or the grade managers or the principals try to behave better. And if they cannot, if they cannot really like improve their skills to be a better teacher, they will may end up to have like the student affairs um, positions to manage student affairs instead of to teach classes. Okay. So they will not be that easy to fire them. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Um, we have some also questions about reform in general. Um, mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, are the obstacles to national education reforms, despite success in some of the reforms in Shanghai? And, and along the same lines, um, do all reforms go through a very long testing period? And what happens if a reform is shown to be useless or problematic or harmful? Well, uh, this kind of long, long question. I'll try to answer what I got. And so, for the so, I'll talk about the reforms who are not less successful first. So, for example, like the spring gao call I talked about just now, which shows to be a not that successful reform because not that much people want to attend the spring gao call because they have more chances in the normal one. So, what happened now is it it is not widely it is not promoted nationwide, and it may may be canceled in Shanghai later, but maybe but after like the pilot experiment, it just stayed in the pilot experiment area. And I think the management department, they will choose their experiment area carefully. So try to make sure they can really made it or made it good. But if not, they'll just don't do it nationwide. And for, can you like, Tell me the question again in the beginning part. Yes, it was a question about how what what kind of obstacles are there to to uh, implementing large scale reform education reforms. Ah, uh, okay. So I guess I guess it depends on what kind of reforms you want to implement. So. Uh, as you know, like in, um, I kind of feel there's not that much obstacles <laughs> because, uh, like I said before, each school, especially public schools, they are belongs to the the management of public. Uh, the, they are belongs to a special level of government. So actually, they are kind of run by the government, and they're used to, like before the principles of the schools are actually also considered as officials. But now they are after the reform that no longer considered as that again now, but still like they, they kind of have these relations. So so you it's kind of like the other reforms in China. So there will be policies come from the higher level management and you just go through like and the policies um, from the higher level ma management department will be more like a guideline, and they they like tell you what you should do about something, but the detail carried out will be decided by the schools according to their own situation. So they will try to change change something accordingly. So I didn't feel that much uh, obstacles obstacles. So or maybe also because they had pilot experiment before, so they know how to implement it more efficiently. Oh. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, in, in your opinion, is, is there an overemphasis in terms of creating university graduates, given that apparently now even bank tellers need to have university degrees? And, and the, the corollary question is, who in China uh, is studying vocational skills? Who is going into more vocational tracks? Ah, uh, okay. So, so for the higher education, uh, there will be a uh, expand to the mass higher education. Try to universe the higher education, uh, like decades ago, like a few, like twenty years ago, I guess. And uh, now, so there is a lot of uh, higher educated students in China who have a little bit problem of finding a job. So that is true, and uh, there. Other like for the people who go to vocational education, normally they are not that good at the 
put like they have lower scores in the exams, so they cannot go to the good universities. And if they cannot go to the good universities, they would prefer to go to like vocational education to have specialized skills instead of go to um, a not that good university with general subjects. So normally like this, and also because they are. Uh, there is a platform now in China that are trying to promote, like trying to encourage people to study more vocational education instead of go to not that good general education. So if so now if you choose to go to vocational education, you may get like a free education or a lot of uh, scholarship things. So uh, now strictly people who are bad at math or bad at getting scores, I go to there. Some people in the middle, they will go there. And there's a third group of people, I think, go to vocational education more, that they are maybe from the underdeveloped area or they are from poor families, and uh, they want to like earn money more efficiently instead of try to compete in the job market. And they also may not be that good at getting scores, so they will go to the vocational education. Okay, well, thank you very much, Juan. Thank you. Andreas, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to weigh in with uh, some thoughts about uh, this presentation and Pisa? No, just saying I want, I want to thank Juan for this <coughs> amazing presentation. Thank you. And also for the work that she has done, because I think uh, people have been stunned by the very strong performance of education, but I do think that the presentation has given a good illustration, a good insight on the kind of policies and practices that actually underpin education in those provinces. And so I, I hope that's been valuable for the audience. Well, thank you. In fact, in fact, we have. One question that just came mm -hmm. in, which I think you might find interesting, uh, this is uh, from a Chinese scholar who's working in the U.S. and is very interested in comparing educa education systems. Do you have any thoughts on what are the most important topics or areas China needs to communicate to other countries? What do you mean by top areas? <laughs> Topics or areas. What what do you think uh, China should be should be talking about more to the rest of the world in terms in terms of their education system? Uh, okay. So for the um, you you mean like so I understand this question from two aspects. So I'm not sure which one did you mean. So the first understanding is what area the China should learn from the rest of the world more. So I think if that part is uh, they should, for example, like the U.S., maybe they should learn from the U.S., they, like, for example, like the Chinese. So I, I guess like uh, here, the challenge I met here is people are so good at making argument, while the Chinese way take in China is more emphasizing on the literature, on how you feel about the, like, the emotional experience expressions and how like how well that is expressed so like the, the the kind of the teacher objective i think they should communicate more with the western world especially um the argument part and also on the creative thinking part so that is a part i think the china should maybe learn more from the western world and the other thing i think china could communicate with the other way I understand this question is I think maybe China is has did a good job there is I think China did a good job is the good education resource are public and the government is trying a good effort to make it available to everybody. So for example, like I, I was from the one of the top universities in China, Tsinghua University. And normally like um, <clears throat> most of the students like you can expect it that Students from rich families have better resources. They are more easy. It's easier for them to attend good schools. But as it's a public school, and the government, also the university, have the social responsibility. So they will left some quota of enrollment, especially for students who are from underdeveloped areas, from poor families. And as long as students get to get into this university, they will make sure they can. They won't. They will finish this. They will make sure they will finish this education with all the 
without considering the economy thing, the, the money thing. So I think in this part, China did a good job. And I, I'm sorry because I'm not a very education related researcher, so I'm not sure about other research topics, but I think they have, China education have their good things and also learn something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both, uh, Yuan Yuan and Andreas, and many thanks for all of our participants uh, once again for your interest both in PISA and in the OECD's work on education in general. Um, we invite you to visit the PISA website, that's www.oecd.org slash PISA, where you'll find the official volumes of the PISA 2004, current and archived issues of PISA in Focus, data visualizations, and several videos about PISA in general and PISA 2015 results in particular. This webinar has been recorded and will be available in a couple of days on our broader website, www.oecd.org edu. Once again, thank you very much and hope to see